On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass Amherst student Maura Murray disappeared in the White Mountains of New Hampshire in one of the most perplexing mysteries of our time. For years, we have covered Maura's case and the tireless online community that surrounds it in great detail. We have since expanded our mission with this series, raising awareness and shining a light on the stories of other missing persons. We now sit on the board of directors of the nonprofit organization Private Investigations for the Missing, which was founded by Bruce Maitland. Bruce's daughter, Brianna Maitland, went missing from Montgomery, Vermont on March 19th of 2004, just six weeks after and about 80 miles away from where Maura Murray vanished. Private Investigations for the Missing aims to assist with investigations for underserved families whose missing loved ones have been forgotten by the media or by law enforcement. Through our growing community, we hope to shed a light on these cold cases. Families and loved ones can reach out to us at investigationsforthemissing.org. This is Missing. Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you today, Tim? I'm doing all right. And in this episode, Lance, we talked to our friend and coworker, Jennifer Amell, about a case that was submitted to Private Investigations for the Missing, the nonprofit that we're both on the board of. And it is about the disappearance of Eric Thomas Alvarado from Atlanta, Texas on November 20th, 2018. That is correct. Uh, We go through all of the information that Jen and PIs for the Missing have put together, the researchers over there, and we break down as many details as we can about this uh, disappearance. And if anyone has any information on the disappearance of Eric Alvarado, please contact the Atlanta Police Department. That's Atlanta, Texas at 903-796-7973. And check out Private Investigations for the Missing at investigationsforthemissing.org. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. Follow us on social media at Missing CSM. And be sure to check out our website at crawlspace-media.com and check out all of our fine programs listed there. Welcome back to the podcast, Jennifer Amell. How are you today? I'm doing wonderful. I have a new hatch in an undisclosed location. I am swimming in packed boxes. Fantastic. So you uh, moved out of the old hatch and you have you have uh, taken up residence in a new hatch. Um, any indication, any hints as to where this is located? Is it in North America? It is in North America, and there is a winter here. Good to know. Good hint. We'll guess uh, in the outtakes. (laughs) Well, Jen, today we're talking about the disappearance of Eric Thomas Alvarado, and this is research that you prepared with help by Erica Zapita and Chief Lou Barry, huh? Yeah, it was a joint effort. Uh, by all those involved with private investigations for the missing. Uh, Erica jumped off and uh, interviewed some of Eric's family members, and she put together a great um, research document. And then Lou kind of did some follow-up and uh, spoke to law enforcement and tried to sort of consolidate the story, because as we get into it, it is a bit of a confusing tale. Yeah, and this was one that we had batted around for a few weeks, maybe even a couple of months, right? I, there has been so many emails about this particular disappearance. Uh, I'm so glad that we're actually able to do it right now because we've been talking about it for for a while. Is that because of all of the details that have made it uh, convoluted? Yeah, it just seems like we had 
gotten a lot of mismatched information from various people, whether they were friends or family members or law enforcement. Um, and when you put it together, it doesn't paint a very linear picture of what happened to Eric the night he disappeared. Um, so as we go through the details, we'll kind of just say what people found, um, what traces were left of Eric's disappearance, and I guess speculate on the sequence of events that could have led to potentially his death. Okay. And this case was submitted to private investigations for the missing, the nonprofit that we all work with, and that is at investigationsforthemissing.org from a woman named Melissa. Okay, let's get into some of the vital statistics of Eric. He was 32 years old when he went missing on November 20th in 2018 from Atlanta, Texas. And that's Atlanta, Texas, not to be confused with Atlanta, Georgia. He is six foot five to six foot seven, 280 pounds ish. He's an Hispanic male, black hair, brown eyes, and his date of birth was just the other day, June 6, 1986. So he'd be 35 at the time of this recording, and uh, there is currently a $10,000 reward. He was last seen wearing a light gray zip-up jacket, a white t-shirt, camouflage print, pajama pants, and mismatched slippers. And Eric's nickname is Slow, and he has the following tattoos. The words Spanish blood on his neck, a large cross on his back between his shoulder blades, his last name Alvarado above his navel, the word Lorenzo around his wrist, and numerous other tattoos on his chest, neck, both arms, and both hands. And we will post photos of his tattoos on social media, and Eric also wears prescription eyeglasses. Now, according to the document here, Jen, it's uh, stated that Eric Alvarado's father, Lorenzo, described him as a great kid, good-hearted, someone who would give his shirt off his back for you. So according to this document, Jen, that you've provided, Eric Alvarado's father, Lorenzo, describes him as, quote, a great kid, good-hearted. He'd give the shirt off his back. If Eric had $2 and you needed $1, he'd give it all to you. He was a teddy bear, end quote. Eric was an accomplished tattoo artist, and he ran a small tattoo business out of his house. And he lived with his wife, Samantha, in the small town in East Texas near the Arkansas border. Atlanta is pretty small, only has a population of 5,495. So the timeline, it looks like, begins at around 1.30 a.m. on November 20th of 2018 when Eric walked out of his home in Atlanta, Texas, clad in his pajama pants, those mismatched slippers. He took two pit bulls, those were his dogs, with him in his truck, which was a newer model black Jeep Cherokee. No one knows why Eric left that night, although some have speculated that he intended to buy cigarettes at a local gas station. But when checked, it was determined the gas station was not open at that hour, so it is unknown why Eric left or whom he was supposed to meet. And Eric curiously had installed security cameras around his house, and there is some footage of him leaving on the night of November 20th. He did not appear to leave in haste, but Samantha did report that Eric had left the front and screen door wide open. And she made a call to 911 about 45 minutes later, around 2.15 a.m., to see if Eric had been in an accident. This strikes me as a little bit of strange behavior, perhaps a little bit preemptive. Um, it's weird that Samantha was so alarmed when so little time had passed after he had left that night. It was about 45 minutes, you said, Tim. Um, so unless she had some knowledge that Eric was going out into a potentially dangerous situation or meeting potentially dangerous people. Um, I don't know why her alarm bells would be ringing at this time. Was it pretty typical for Eric and Samantha to be up and about at 2.15 in the morning? Um, do, do we know anything about their behavior? Like, were they night owls? Which I guess they were. It seems like they were. It seems like they had a house that people would often like come over and hang out at. I mean, Eric gave tattoos out of his house. Um, it seems like that night there had been a few neighbors and friends over their house. Um, everybody had left the house by 1.30 a.m. It seems like and Eric and Samantha were alone in their home, but it doesn't seem like a completely out of character um, decision to run out for some reason at that hour. 
And aside from the tattoo business, is there anything known about any other occupation that he had or any other trade that he had? Uh, nothing official that I know. No, no job in town that I'm aware of. And at 7 a.m. on the morning of November 20th, Samantha tried calling police to report Eric missing. The police told her that he was an adult and had the right to go off on his own, and unless she had reason to believe he was endangered, that it was too early to file a missing persons report. However, Samantha said that he had stolen her dog, and one dog apparently belonged to Samantha and one to Eric, and at this time the police put out a bulletin on Eric's Jeep. Yeah, so I'm not sure that Samantha actually thought that Eric had stolen her dog. I think it was just a tactic to get the police to respond to, I guess, a crime that had been committed. So at least they would be on the lookout for that Jeep. So I guess taking someone's dog is considered a crime. And it looks like about an hour later at 8 a.m., Samantha notified Eric's family that he was missing. And at 11 a.m., On November 20th, Eric's Jeep was found by the Arkansas State Troopers on Highway 71 in Little River County, Arkansas, in a town called Ogden, which is about 47 miles from his home in Atlanta, Texas, and it was found out of gas. Interesting. Now we're dealing with another one of these situations where a car is abandoned. This one happens to be out of gas. I'm assuming the dogs weren't in it, but it's empty across state lines, and three hours after... Samantha notified his family that he was missing. So she's been very preemptive about the whole thing. Yeah, indeed. I mean, her, yeah, her alarm was raised super early. I mean, we almost never hear of that kind of time span for someone like reporting a missing person unless it's a child and you know that like they can't be off on their own. Yeah, it makes you wonder what condition he left the house in or the condition of the last time Samantha saw him, which I imagine was that night. Was he very uh, intoxicated, perhaps? Uh, Did they get into an argument? There doesn't seem to be any answers to those questions here, but those are the ones that pop up in my head. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I didn't didn't get any report of a fight between the two uh, before he left. As to his state of mind, I think they were doing a little bit of drinking, perhaps smoking some pot. Um, but not like incredibly intoxicated that he would, you know, get lost somewhere where, you know, this was his hometown. This is a town he knew well. There had to be some reason that he was driving nearly 50 miles away or he was abducted somewhere close to home and his car was taken to the Arkansas border. I mean, there's no real way to tell where Eric uh, ended up and where his vehicle ended up. Yeah, and the timeline moves very fast. Very fast. Yeah, yeah. This all develops really quickly. So, I mean, you have to cut about an hour out of it just for travel time alone. Oh, for sure, right? 47 miles, yeah, depending on how fast you're going. Yeah, that's at least 45 minutes to an hour. Aside from Samantha, who else saw him leave the house? Uh, That's it. I mean, we have security footage of him leaving, and uh, the footage is in the custody of the police. Um, They have not released it publicly. But I think according to them, he didn't seem to be agitated. He didn't seem to be rushing anywhere. It was just kind of a normal walking out the door into the car. He took his dogs, which is, I mean, some people just take their dogs everywhere. Um, But taking two pit bulls kind of like reads to me that he wanted to potentially protect himself or intimidate somebody. So the Arkansas State Police were called out to the area because Another vehicle was found half submerged in a nearby lake, and it was during this investigation that a trooper discovered Eric's Jeep and listed it as an abandoned vehicle and left a tow tag. Yeah, so this is where it gets super confusing. So the the Arkansas State Police were called out to uh, somebody who saw another abandoned vehicle, which was not Eric's Jeep. And it was uh, in the water, in the lake. Um, and when they were investigating that, they found Eric's car and they're like, they, they didn't know if the two vehicles were connected in any way. And they still don't, to my knowledge. But because like, it didn't look like a crime scene or anything, uh, the state trooper just left a, a tag for the tow truck to come eventually tow it that day. And later that day, Samantha, Derek Alvarado, Matt Alvarado, and their cousin Orlando all went to the area where the vehicle was abandoned. Little River Sheriff's Department towed the vehicle back but did not process it forensically. 
Eric's family and Samantha conducted a search of the area where the Jeep was abandoned and found nothing. Then they returned to Atlanta, Texas. Okay, what does that mean? They towed it back. They knew it was... The sheriff's department knew the car was abandoned by Eric. They had the statements already from Samantha from the previous night, and they did not process it forensically. Correct, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if a connection was made with the Little River County Sheriff's Department and the actual missing persons report. Um, There was a bolo out on the Jeep because of the stolen dog situation, but I don't think they knew it was a missing person. So Eric's family and Samantha conducted a search of the area where the Jeep was abandoned and found nothing, and then they returned back to Atlanta. On Saturday, November 24th, about 20 friends and family returned to the area. Samantha stayed at a rest area nearby. One of them spotted one of the pit bulls dead on the side of the road. A second dog was found deceased in the median strip. The dog on the side of the road had been severely mangled, possibly struck by a tractor trailer. And one of the searchers, a young boy, found one of Eric's shoes. With it was the tow slip that the trooper had left. Of course, we're talking about a tow truck slip. And that was turned over to the sheriff's department, Detective Kenimore, who had everyone move to the way station while they did a scene search. They were told due to the circumstances to report Eric as a missing person then to the Atlanta PD. So that tow tag that was left on the Jeep, I'm assuming like on the under a windshield wiper or like, you know, tucked uh, in the window uh, somewhere. This tow tag was found, I want to say close to 100 yards away, like kind of far away from the Jeep in one of Eric's slippers. So someone had to have revisited the scene, revisited the Jeep, removed the tag and located or brought with them one of Eric's slippers, placed the tag inside and then taken the slipper far away, but not far enough from the Jeep. So this is just super strange. And both dogs were hit by? Yeah, they couldn't really determine a cause of death on the dogs, but they they don't think it was necessarily shot or stabbed, but potentially that they had been hit by a truck on the road. And it's actually a fact that the tow truck tag was found inside his slipper. Mm -hmm. Which is just kind of weird. It seems kind of, I don't know, intentional or something. It's almost like some kind of dark joke right tote tag found in a slipper i don't i don't know when was the tag placed on the vehicle it was placed on the vehicle the morning after his disappearance at like 8 a.m at 11 a.m 11 a.m around then because that's when the state police were called out on the other vehicle that was submerged in the lake and that's when they found the jeep placed the tow tag and then four days later on the 24th uh, when the uh, when Eric's family and friends come to do a search, this is when they find the tow tag in the slipper scattered away from the Jeep. When was the vehicle towed? I believe it was towed that day, November 21st. So somebody had to come back and take that tow tag out from the truck, from the Jeep, between the time that everybody left the scene and when the tow truck came to get it. Mm-hmm. I mean, wouldn't the tow driver be the person to remove that tag? It seems like w- that would be the process, but yeah. it just seems really I- random that that tag ended up in the slipper of Eric. Yeah, I think the tow driver would have to turn the tag in or something to prove that, you know, it's almost like a paper trail of... Yeah, like a receipt. Yeah, like a serial number or something that you could track, you know, the movements of the vehicles, like where they're storing it and stuff. So I wonder if there was like any to do when the tow truck did get there. Um, I think it was at the behest of Little River Sheriff's Department that they towed the vehicle. So there was a police presence there when the vehicle was removed. But I don't think at that time that they knew like it was a potential crime scene. Very strange. It's, it's incredibly strange. So we have in the notes here later that day, Samantha, Derek, and Matt Alvarado and their cousin Orlando all went to the area where the vehicle was abandoned That's when the Little River Sheriff's Department towed the vehicle back. So the tag was not on it at that point. Couldn't have been. Unless it was, and they didn't note it, because that seems like a thing that would just be there, because they were notified that the tow tag was there. 
Okay, so maybe the toe tag was there, and then whoever took it and put it with the slipper had to have done it from the toe lot. Yeah, potentially. Why would you even do that? Either the slipper with the toe tag was not in the vicinity of the of the Jeep when they initially searched, like Samantha and Derek and Matt and their cousin, when they initially searched, or they just missed it in their search. Um, because eventually during another search, the Jeep's keys were found clipped to a fence nearby. And let me throw out something kind of weird. And I'm only saying this because there is another bizarre coincidence that we're about to talk about. But uh, what about the possibility of the tag just, you know, fall blowing off the car and then actually blowing into the slipper? I mean, I know that sounds completely insane. But again, there is another kind of crazy coincidence that we're about to talk about. It's true. I mean, it's it makes as much sense as somebody like either visiting the truck at the tow site or removing the tag when the Jeep was already there, like in this very narrow window of time when nobody was looking. Do you know where the Jeep is now? And has it been processed uh, since then? It has never been forensically processed. Um, Shortly after it was towed, I think it was stored for maybe a few days. And then they released it back into the custody of Samantha, Eric's wife, who then had to surrender the vehicle because of lack of payment. So that vehicle could potentially be in someone else's possession and they're they're driving it currently. Mm-hmm. Mo- most likely. Most likely. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't like a beat up car. It was relatively new, looked nice. And, you know, we don't know if there's any evidence in the car either. You know, I mean, if Eric had driven it, there would be no reason to forensically test it, I'd say. You know, unless there's evidence of someone else having been in that vehicle or some violence having taken place in there, you know? I mean, I, I feel like uh, law enforcement is not in a rush to, like, print cars because they're going to get a million fingerprints of uh, the fingerprints of everyone who's been in that car. Yeah, totally. And at the time, they didn't suspect that a crime had been committed. And so that Sunday, a detective and captain from Atlanta, Texas, from that police department, they drove to Ogden, Arkansas, and found those keys that you mentioned, Jen, clipped to the fence. Yeah, I'm thinking somebody was probably walking through the area and um, found the keys on the ground and then clipped them to the fence so that, you know, somebody if somebody was coming back looking for the keys, they would more easily see them. So Detective Hicks with the Atlanta, Texas Police Department was the first detective assigned to the case to Eric's disappearance. And this was a coincidence that you had mentioned, right, that... uh Detective Hicks had bought the house next door to Eric and Samantha's home. He was not living at this residence at the time of Eric's disappearance, but had bought the property to flip. The family asked that Detective Hicks be taken off the case because of this perceived conflict of interest. The case was reassigned and quickly went cold after that. Yeah, I'm not sure why the family was so insistent that Detective Hicks be taken off the case, um, as you stated. He wasn't actually living at that residence. Like he didn't, he never even met Eric or Samantha, according to his own statement to Chief Lou Barry. So I'm not sure why they thought it was a conflict of interest at all. And did he buy the property after the disappearance? No, it was before, several months before. Several months before and bought it because he wanted to flip the property in a town that's not very big. Where's the conflict of interest? I don't know. Maybe they didn't know that Detective Hicks wasn't living there, but I'm not sure how they even found out that Hicks owned the house. Like maybe he had been by to do work on the house or something. But uh, according to Hicks, he had never met Eric. I see the conflict of interest on its face, but it doesn't seem like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know how many detectives they have at the Atlanta, Texas Police Department. Probably one, uh, maybe two. Yeah, and I think Detective Hicks had done quite a bit of work on this case before he was eventually taken off of it. So it's kind of a sore spot for him, too, that it's not his case anymore. Yeah, I mean, I guess in a perfect world, you'd rather someone else who's not your neighbor working on the case, but if there's no other option. Has anyone from uh, Private Investigations for the Missing spoken with uh, Detective Hicks? Yeah, uh, Lou Barry spoke with him. Oh, he actually did speak directly to him. Okay. Yeah, he did. He he got a lot of information. Hicks was um, kind of instrumental in 
laying out this timeline because we were very confused on the facts and like exact because it did seem so close together like it moved so quickly like from his disappearance to the truck to you know a, a report being filed and an investigation started it seemed um like it couldn't possibly have happened that fast but detective hicks like was was pretty good about sort of explaining the sequence of events what was his demeanor um it seemed like he really cared about the case and like i said it was is a it was a real um disappointment to him to be taken off of it because uh, as i said before he put in a lot of hours into this case and had interviewed a lot of people so he's he's said that no answers have been um uncovered for eric's disappearance no one has been charged and we really don't know if he's alive or or deceased i mean it kind of went cold after a short amount of time um and currently i don't think anyone is actively investigating this case. You mentioned earlier that they would have people over and they were probably having a few drinks and maybe smoking a little marijuana. Um, Was there any indication or anybody stating that there might have been an argument with somebody at that party? I know the security cameras showed that he didn't leave in what would seem like a rush or storming out, but any sort of indication of of a conflict no no not at all it seemed like a normal night for eric there is a couple um loose details he did have a wallet that was given to him by a friend that had i believe some money in it but it was found almost a year later in samantha's house he might have been carrying a different wallet when he went missing so not really sure if he had left his wallet behind or if he had taken it with him. And then additionally, he did not have a phone with him at the time. His phone was out of minutes. So he left that at home as well. Who found the wallet? So Samantha moved out of the house like pretty in a pretty short amount of time. Like I want to say it was like four or five months after his disappearance. She moved out of the house. And then the person who moved into the house found the wallet in a closet. Like buried or... No, just kind of left there. Like I said, it could have been an extra wallet. But it had money in his ID in it? I don't think it had IDs. But it had some money. But she had moved out. So she like packed her stuff and moved out. So, mm-hmm. And moved in with another romantic partner. Well, that's very peculiar. Why do, why do articles that he owned pop up just randomly? I know. There's all these like pieces of him of his property like breadcrumbs left in this case and it's really hard to to piece together how they would have been left in the places they've they were left yeah i don't know why i'm getting so hung up on the wallet but it's been a year and you moved out and i mean we've all moved from locations where we've lived and i mean you don't really pack up a few things and then go like you think that that would just be noticed like his wallet Who knows? Maybe she thought he was going to come back to claim it. So what do you guys think? I think he was going to meet somebody. I don't know for what reason, but maybe it was illegal. He got into trouble and they, one person or many people, abducted him, dumped dumped the car. And I really don't know about the slipper and toe tag stuff. But it seems like because there was another vehicle found submerged in the lake near where his vehicle was found it seems like that was maybe a dump site for illicit activity yeah that's the first thing that came to my mind we you said two abandoned cars you know re- very close to each other um i think that's a possibility mm-hmm. definitely seems like a suspicious disappearance to me yeah i would really like to know if those two vehicles were tied together like who owned the other vehicle that was abandoned and did you know eric and where where are we at now with this? Like I said, it's pretty cold. Nobody's really yeah. actively investigating it. And that's part of the reason why they brought this case to private investigations for the mis- missing to uh, invigorate the investigation. I look to the dogs as kind of the most suspicious sort of aspect of this case um, because the dogs lost their lives. And we don't know about Eric at this point. Um but the dogs lost their lives. Something very dire, you would have to imagine, happened that night, either to get Eric to leave his house with the dogs or 
something out there. And I'm, I'm assuming something definitely out there happened that was dire. Um, I guess maybe something happened to put Eric and those dogs at that location, too. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's evidence of violence. I it, um, I find it hard to believe that, like, you know, one dog might have been run over by a car, but both of them? And at the same time, they were found relatively close together. Like, it seems like potentially they were killed first, and then maybe one. Or running across the highway, right? Or, or road. It does sound like they were running across the road. Mm-hmm. Maybe chasing someone or following Eric. I don't know. It's a truly baffling case, um, and that's why we need people to come forward who might have information about this case to maybe tie together some of these details. If you were the person who clipped those keys to the fence, call law enforcement. My goodness, like it makes absolutely no sense without more information. And if you have any information, please call the Atlanta, Texas Police Department at 903-796-7973.